President Donald Trump has signed the spending bill to avoid another government shutdown. Some people say he caved. Some people say we're hashtag winning. Some people think it's all 40 chess and we'll go over all of that. So stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, commie. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, as always, to Heck Off Kami. We're going to get back on the normal schedule now that that speaking event is over. That didn't go exactly as planned, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that at the end of the video. But first, we have to talk about President Trump. Has he caved on immigration? Let me start by saying that, as most of you know, I am a devout Trump supporter. Nothing but respect for my president. I still support President Trump. I will vote for him in 2020. But something that I think we're often afraid to do is criticize him. The reason for that is that the media and the left, basically synonymous, they hate President Trump. They hate everything about who he is, what he represents. So given that hatred, they take this top-down approach and say, okay, I hate this guy. I want to spread negativity about him. Let's go after him for eating KFC with a fork, or let's misrepresent something he said about illegal aliens. And Trump supporters are so used to having to defend Trump for these stupid criticisms. There's almost this threshold that you have to cross mentally in order to support Trump. When you accept Trump into your life, not to sound like a heretic, and you give him your support, there's this certain mental barrier that you break down where you basically say what this man represents has transcended his character, meaning that because Washington has failed us, because the swamp doesn't care about the people, it doesn't matter what Trump has allegedly said or what he's allegedly done. Once you enter the state of mind that says, we need a guy like Trump, there's no turning back from there, which is why the Democrats have absolutely nothing for 2020 if they're going to continue to slander him and spread falsehoods about him. They did that so much in 2016. I don't believe there's any new story or new allegation they could dig up for 2020 that would compel a 2016 Trump supporter to say, that was over the line. I can't vote for him again. The problem that President Trump is going to face isn't going to come from the Democrats. It's going to come from his record while in office. If the Democrats were smart, they'd exploit that and say, he said he'd build a wall, but he hasn't yet. Vote for me. But they won't do that because they don't want the wall either. They want what's effectively, you know, open borders. So we have this allegiance to our president. And I think that's good because we're standing by him despite all the media BS. But the problem is that when Trump does something wrong, his base needs to be critical of him. One of Trump's greatest strengths and weaknesses is that he doesn't get his drive from arguments or policy. He gets all of his drive from the energy of his base. And that's because the guy has a tremendous ego. He just very very extroverted, but that's where it gets us into trouble because Trump can let down his supporters and then walk into a rally and you've got thousands of screaming Trump supporters wearing MAGA hats and, you know, he doesn't understand the unrest within his base to the degree that he should, I don't think. And when guys like Sean Hannity talk about it, then he hears it and it gets to him. And uh, don't take this, oh, John's blue pill, he's turned his back on the president. That's not it. I still have my MAGA hat signed by Mike Pence, of course. I'm not going to burn it or anything like those other people did. I just think, when the media criticize Trump, they do it because they hate him. When we do it, it's because we support him. We want him to do better. We aren't trying to tear him down. We're trying to motivate him. And we're too often afraid to do that because we're constantly defending our president from the media. And we don't want, you know, on the one hand to say, uh, you know, stop criticizing Trump. And then, hey, Trump, you know, you let us down on this. But we need to do that because the record shows that he that gets him to respond. And he doesn't have a lot of uh, support from his constituents, which is partially why we didn't have the wall being built before midterms. Republicans were largely not in support of it. And that's what happens when you campaign on draining the swamp and then you have to actually work within the swamp. Mitch McConnell, who is the face of the swamp, if there ever was one, at least in the Republican side, reportedly told Trump in their first meeting in Trump Tower that he had to back off the whole drain the swamp talk. Despite that opposition, Trump is keeping a lot of his promises. And I think that he's been generally pretty successful. He's kept, or at least tried to keep most of his promises pertaining to immigration, which was the issue of his campaign, things like cutting off immigration from terror-prone countries, but that's not what we were chanting at the rallies. We weren't chanting, cut it off. We were, we, were, we were chanting, build the wall. So he signs this bill yesterday to avoid the shutdown. And what does it do? And to his credit, he was not going to sign it at all until they convinced him that it wouldn't interfere with the national emergency declaration. So you've got $1.4 billion for the construction of barriers, but they have to be a specific type of barrier. They can only be designs that are already in use. So all the prototypes that we paid a few million dollars for are effectively obsolete at this point. We didn't get the entire southern border. We got 55 miles. For some context, it's about 2,000 miles long. 80% has no man-made barrier to stop people from crossing on foot. But hey, defense plus 55. Uh, so I guess 1.4 billion, which is a fraction of the 5.7 billion he was asking for, totally ignores the administration's request for 750 more patrol agents, 2,000 more ICE agents. Some of the criticism I don't think is accurate, though. A lot of people are saying that there's amnesty in the bill. No, there isn't. They're talking about a section that says federal dollars can't go towards the deportation of potential sponsors. 
of illegal alien children. DHS has come out and clarified that there's a process you actually have to go through in order to be considered a sponsor that includes photo identification, proof of re residency, and also paperwork specifically about the child. And it's only for unaccompanied children, so adults can't just walk in with kids and claim uh, amnesty or whatever. But we just have to hope that the DHS at this point keeps their word. Um, and the bill's going to expire before the end of the fiscal year, so this isn't technically permanent as long as it isn't reintroduced afterwards. It also increased funding for alternatives to detention, which means catch and release effectively when they arrest you and they can't legally detain you because they have nowhere to house you and the bill only authorized something like 5,000 more beds which is less than ICE actually has so they're basically just going to slap an ankle bracelet on them and hope that they follow instructions when they're allowed into the country at that point and this is stupid I mean what purpose does that serve I mean ideally we'd have more agents and resources to process these people then Trump goes and he declares a national emergency which I predicted would happen for those of you that were listening back then so from there, so from there he could yeah, easily he could declare easily this declare to be a national, national emergency, emergency. In which case, in which he case could he allocate could federal, federal dollars, dollars to this barrier, barrier without, congressional without congressional approval. And that's going to free up $8 billion for roughly 234 miles of barrier. The problem is that the lawsuits were filed almost immediately by public citizens, public citizen, whatever, which I think is a watchdog group, and then you've got ACLU jumped in there. This is a legal battle that Trump is very likely going to win, but it's going to delay things. And the Democrats and the Congress have already said that they're going to try and stop it there. But in order to do that, they'd actually need a signature from Trump to undo his declaration, which is not going to happen. And there's no way that the congressional Republicans would ever try and override his veto. So that's a dead end that's only being pursued for publicity points at this point by the Democrats. And from what I've seen, the arguments that they're trying to make are that it isn't actually a national emergency, therefore the declaration is invalid. And Trump's going to win this one in the end when it goes to the Supreme Court inevitably. But ironically, the thing that hurts this case that it's a national emergency the most is how much Trump has compromised on the negotiations. Because they'll say, if it were really such a national emergency, he wouldn't have budged at all on anything pertaining to this for the last two years, be it the $25 billion for DACA, or the border adjustment tax, the three-week reopening of the government, whichever examples they want to use. So we're going to get a decent victory once this gets through the courts, but unfortunately, it's going to take a while. But we still need to make sure we're holding Trump to the highest standard possible. This guy is driven by his ego. That's not a bad thing, but the Democrats know this too. So they were very careful this time around. It's it's been reported that the Democrats were actually amused in private that he agreed to sign it, but then they agreed not to gloat about it publicly because they knew that it would probably cause Trump to just go ahead and veto it, which is good judgment on their part. The only thing that can help the Democrats in 2020 is if Trump hurts himself by angering his base. So it's up to us, the active members of his base, to make sure that he hears us when he does something that we don't like. Because if he doesn't, he's going to upset his base and they won't be compelled to turn out like they did in 2016 for him. 40 chess. <laughs> 4D chess. I'm really, I'm convinced that 4D chess is the Trump equivalent to the left saying it's Mueller time. Like they've got this totally unrealistic fantasy of Robert Mueller being this genius prosecutorial legal mind. It's going to expose Trump for trying to destroy the country from within because the left is patriotic and cares about America all of a sudden. 4D chess. Maybe. I mean, I'll say I, I'll be the first to admit that I'm wrong. If I see it, I'll eat my words. But anyway, so I had that speech at U of M the other night. Uh, I was talking about second wave feminism, the degeneracy of the sexual revolution, how that's caused divorce rates to go up, unwed childbirths to go up, and the room was practically empty, which I expected. I knew that going into it, I really just wanted to get the video of me giving the speech so that I could post it here for you guys to see. And it was a great speech. But anyway, so I'm about halfway through it, and I just glanced down at my notes, and I noticed that the audio preamp just wasn't on. The outlet that it was plugged into just stopped producing electricity, so no audio was being recorded. And I just... I got like one of those moments, you know, like something bad happens. You're just like, hmm, okay. Like, I guess, I guess this is what we're dealing with. And then you're like, all right, well, let's go. We'll move on from here. Like now that that's established, we will continue whatever it is that's going on. And like whenever something really bad happens, I try and just view myself in the third person and just think like, huh, this guy just can't get a break. And it actually, it puts things into perspective pretty well. I recommend it. So I don't have a video of the speech. I might record parts of it broken down into the different segments and then just put it up. I might recycle it later on. Who knows? But so that's what happened with that. It's a bummer. Hey guys, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and leave me a comment. And click my face down there to subscribe. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Mainly concerned about Twitter and Instagram. I don't have a big enough Twitter presence. And uh, I, I tweet funny things. The other day I tweeted that if your most recent if your most recently used emoji isn't the crying laughing face, then you're not secreting enough serotonin. People thought that was pretty funny, so you might enjoy it. Thank you so much for watching as always, and may God bless America.